All right. Good evening and welcome to the North Texas Food Bank's virtual town hall. My name is Erica Yeager and I serve as the Chief External Affairs Officer for the Food Bank. So during our time together tonight, we want to give you an overview of what the North Texas Food Bank has been experiencing since the onset of the COVID pandemic, our response plan, and the impact on our food and secure neighbors. So our President Chief Executive Officer, Tricia Cunningham, will provide you with these insights and we'll be joined by the Food Bank's Chief Operating Officer, Brad Stewart, at the end to answer your questions, which many of you pre-submitted. If you have a question during the webinar, please enter it in the Q&A box on your screen. So your microphones will be set to mute during the presentation. But with that, I turn it over to Tricia. Thanks so much, Erica. You know, before I get started, I, I truly just want to thank all of you for your unwavering support. You know, these, these really are unprecedented times and your generosity has allowed us and our feeding network to feed more people than we've ever fed before. And you know, this effort has been a partnership with our donors and supporters all coming together to help us meet the need. And you know, I really swell with pride thinking about what we can accomplish together. You're looking at this photo that's outside of our Pro Family Campus. Many of you contributed to this campus. Uh, it more than doubled our capacity when we moved here in the fall of 2018, and it's strategically located in the middle of the 13 counties that we serve. I wanna share a story that's part of the fabric of the North Texas Food Bank. At the very front of this building is a giant sculpture by local artist Brad Oldham titled Lulu May's Mark. And Lulu May was the mother of the late Ross Perot Sr. and Betty Perot. And during the Great Depression, an X was placed on the curb of Lulu May's home to indicate it was a place where hungry people could be fed. She told her kids that the hungry was just like us, only a little down on their luck. I think about that moment in history and how so many people were facing hunger. And our crisis, our country right now is in crisis again. And you know, now more than ever, that mark is a symbol of hope and nourishment for so many. The food bank proudly carries that legacy that Lulu May and the Perot family created. So let's go into the next slide. There we go. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the food bank serves 13 diverse counties here in North Texas. We serve urban, suburban, and rural hunger primarily through a robust feeding network made up of more than 250 partner agencies. The food bank role is to stock the shelves of these local food pantries and try to provide them access to nutritious food so that they can serve their local hungry neighbors. About 80% of our food goes through these partners. Every food bank nationwide was impacted by COVID-19 with its widespread health and economic impact but this is different than any other crisis that we've faced. You can't prepare for that, but food banks have responded. It has required innovation and nimbleness, but this is what we do. We stand in the gap for those who need our help. As the pandemic goes on, our needs have really skyrocketed. And at the same time, our need for food, funds, and laborers have increased. So early on, one of our largest challenges for the North Texas Food Bank and other nonprofits was a consistent labor force. As volunteers started to cancel, the needs that we needed were rising. We literally had company representatives that stood at our doors and told their employees that they couldn't volunteer to their own new policies, which we understood. And initially, many of us redeployed our own staff to work on the volunteer floors while they also tried to keep their day jobs but we knew that the needs would only increase and we needed a better solution. So our board chair worked with the Communities Foundation of Texas and Shift Smart to start an initiative called Get Shift Done that employed out of work hospitality workers to work at the food bank and our local partner agencies and other nonprofits. This model now is expanded to food banks nationwide. And this photo is one of the Shift Smart workers, Marco. Marco was a bartender, who had lost his job when the restaurant that he worked at closed at the start of the pandemic. The Get, Sh the Get Shift Done uh, North Texas initiative allowed hospitality industry workers like Marco to really roll up their sleeves and really help to feed families across North Texas while they were also feeding their own families. I visited a restaurant for takeout that had just reopened last week 
and they saw my NTFB lapel pin on and they actually thanked me for the opportunity to pick up some shifts here while they were out of work. Our team was really floored by how efficient these team members were. They were producing kitted boxes at a rapid pace and uh, we are so thankful for them. So we shifted our distribution method to more of a drive-through model, which did require kitted boxes of healthy food. So this model is being used by our feeding network and other food banks uh, as a safer, low to no touch client delivery method. However, it does require more supplies and more labor, which equals more cost in our traditional method of delivering food on pallets to our partner agencies and our mobile distributions. This method also meant that we would need a lot more space, even though we just moved into this beautiful building, you know, that's three times larger than our former location, uh, we had to have extra space. So we've secured an additional 50,000 square feet off site where we are also doing kitting and storage of some of the kitted boxes as well. And so this temporary space is going to help us to ensure that we can meet or exceed our goal of over 60,000 food boxes each week. Um, as the needs in our community continued to increase, the North Texas Food Bank was able to call upon the National Guard for support. We were notified on April 1st that our request was approved. Our team trained the National Guard leaders on April 4th and on April 6th, we had 288 members of the Texas Military Department National Guard who were de deployed to give us extra staff to meet the increased need in our region. Our, our workforce was literally doubled overnight and it's something that I never expected to see were platoons of National Guard members forming on our, on our parking lot to be able to help us. With the arrival of the National Guard, that also allowed some of the shift smart workers to assist additional nonprofits and more of our partner network who were also experiencing a lot of volunteer shortages. Guard members are currently helping us into June uh, they're being approved on a 30-day increment or less. It depends on what it is, but they're helping us on the production floor, actually kitting boxes. They are also helping us in our warehouse operations. They're driving trucks for us, uh, our mobile food distributions, uh, and also agency support for some of our larger agencies as well. So their, their support really has been critical. They've helped us to increase our food box production versus our normal volunteer shifts. And to date, they've helped us to distribute more than 11 million pounds of food. Some weeks they've produced as many as 75,000 boxes. And what you're seeing here is about a 25 to 27 pound box of shelf stable food, nutritionally balanced. It provides about 21 meals. It has protein, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. Think items like peanut butter, canned tuna, whole wheat pasta, rice, lentils, um, all those kind of things. So early on in the pandemic, you heard stories of these empty shelves at the local grocery stores. And with higher demand, supply was limited. And as they restocked their shelves, donated product to us and our partners went down during that time period, which resulted in an increased expense for us as we were purchasing more of the food items for these boxes, if we could get them. In addition to the pantry staples that I mentioned earlier, we're also um, distributing fresh produce. And every box of fresh produce is different, but we try to have at least three varieties in there. And you can think of good hearty veg fruits and vegetables like apples and sweet potatoes, carrots, oranges, and everyone would receive at least uh, one of the 15 pound boxes of these produce boxes to supplement also the dry food box that they receive. So our primary way to get food to those that need it, as I mentioned earlier, is through our feeding network of agencies that have food pantries and other feeding programs. Typically, we want those who are hungry to go through these local community pantries if possible, because they also provide other services that can help evaluate why they're hungry and help them to get back on their feet. We want them to have that local community relationship. So we have more than 250 of those partners in our network and we are extremely grateful here in North Texas that we've only had a, had a few that have closed during this time of crisis. Much different than some of our other partners across the country. And that was mainly due to health concerns or lack of volunteers as often many of the volunteers are in those high risk categories. Our partners in April 
distributed 61% more food than they did April a year ago. Actually, almost 64% more food. And then some of the larger agents are, are even kidding more of their own food. And you can see where we are there through uh, middle of the month. We're almost to what we were at the end of the month last year at this time. So what you see here is a map that showcases the geographic footprint of our partner agencies. Uh, we serve those 13 counties and our agencies have shared that on average about 37% of those who are seeking assistance are there for the first time. And those that have been there before, often many of them even need more assistance now. Their lines are long. I know some of them are even on this call and could, could certainly uh, attest to that. And all of our agencies are experiencing an increase in client count, some of them more than 900% versus what they were prior to the pandemic. With agencies getting about 80% of their food from the food bank on average, we knew that we had to do as much as we could to try to get as much food out the door to meet their needs. We eliminated all of our handling fees uh, to ensure that partners would receive the food that they needed. Also, um, you may have heard about a historic grant from Amazon's Jeff Bezos to Feeding America. We re-received a portion of that grant, that was his desire, but we used that to be able to help our partners purchase some items for what some of their growing needs were. Agencies are purchasing what they need to support their communities. So for example, Amazing Grace is one of our partners in Wiley, and they use the grant to be able to purchase some freezers for storage. They shared that they are seeing a 119% increase versus first quarter of last year. We've also seen whether forklifts, even personal protective equipment, tents to cover where they're doing these drive-through distributions and supplemental food uh, are some of the other items that they are, are using the funding for to better serve our region. So drive-through distributions, um, this is how we're really having to meet the needs. They're really great. And we knew that our partners really needed some help to handle the surge of volume. So food banks across the country, including the North Texas Food Bank, we had to ramp our own direct service through our mobile distributions in the areas of high needs in the counties that we served. And so this drive-through method is a way that we're able to keep everyone safe by implementing social distancing practices. And we've got truly tremendous feedback from the community. We host several mobile pantry distributions each week and just in order to try to help meet the demands. And we partner with many of our partner agencies in these. Prior to COVID-19, uh, one of our mobile distributions might, probably would have served about 200 to 300 families at a mobile pantry site. Now we're serving a uh, thousand to sometimes more than 2000 households at each site. So this slide shows the impact of our mobile distributions. In April, we distributed 307%, I'm sorry, now it's 310% uh, more than April of, of 2019. And in May, you can see where we are. We're already at 371% what we were of May of last year. Uh, and we're not even at the end of the month yet. So we're continuing to expand this effort in the coming weeks and months. And we're going to be teaming up again with our partner agencies in these areas so that that way they can sort of help build some of those personal connections as well. So if you've watched the news lately, you've likely seen the coverage of our mobile distributions at Fair Park. Uh, we've held three distributions so far, and they've actually set a record for the most families served with more than 2,000 in less than three hours, distributing more than two tractor trailer loads of food. Some of the cars began lining up more than six hours before the distribution began. I was at our third distribution and at the first one as well, but I was there a couple of weeks ago when the line started forming at 1.30 in the morning for a 9 a.m. distribution. We had four lines of cars that stretched almost at one and a half miles each. You know, and I guess this is a thing that has been surreal for me. People just don't do that unless they're hungry. Uh, you know, we've often said that hunger is hidden as you don't realize that those that have jobs actually need a little help. However, I think what we can say now is that hunger isn't hidden anymore. 
it's important to note that while needs are increasing in every zip code, the underserved areas like South Dallas were really hit hard by the virus. This region has many neighbors with high rates of underlying health conditions. Uh, many of them are diet related, which underscores that access to healthy food has never been more important. You know, the need is staggering and devastating at the same time. More than 30,000 households have been served via our mobile distributions in the last two and a half months. But unprecedented times call for unprecedented responses. All food banks across the country have had to shift their business operations uh, to really support what the needs are now while maintaining their own business continuity and employ client safety. At the food bank here, we've been running 24 seven warehouse operations with three shifts, not only to meet the increase in needs, but also to reduce our risk in case someone were infected on one of the shifts, we wouldn't have to totally shut down. This requires extra manpower and resources, which also increase cost. We've also extended receiving loads of food into the evening. Early on uh, here at the North Texas Food Bank, we quickly formed a pandemic task force, which allowed us to help double our physical food distribution thanks to the stellar cooperation across our organization. Developing, building, and delivering a box of food is really touched by almost every area of the food bank. In April, we distributed more than 9 million pounds of food, that's seven and a half million meals, as compared to four and a half million pounds or 3.75 million meals in January. In fact, we hit our highest food output number in NTFB history, distributing more than 2.6 million pounds of food in just one week. To just a little comparison there, a typical week is about 1.1 million pounds prior to COVID. And whenever the food bank started, we distributed 400,000 pounds in a year. All of this was during a time whenever accessing food was, was challenging for many food banks. Uh, we've had to increase purchasing of food, but the lead times often are four to six weeks out and sometimes at a price premium. However, we actually are in a better position than some of our sister food banks in other parts of the country. As you think about West Texas, and how they've been hit so hard due to oil prices and sometimes even negative oil prices. And they've even had a harder time trying to get food in the door there, even though the needs even are greater. So just to put a little data behind this, um, here's a slide that talks about food insecurity projections. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of these and this, this is one that we got from Feeding America. They have three different scenarios based on current food insecurity projections. And for Texas, we currently have 4.3 million food insecure people, which is about 15% of the population. Projections for the C scenario, which is the red line there on the left chart, would have us at about 5.8 million people, or about 20.2% of the people in Texas being food insecure. With what we're seeing right now, that's likely conservative because on the right, you can see that since mid-March, over 1.8 million people from March 15th to May 2nd applied for unemployment. Pre-pandemic data, we were, we were doing great. We were actually looking at having the lowest food insecurity rates since before the Great Recession. However, with the coronavirus pandemic, that's really gonna change these numbers in all 50 states, including Texas. According to their research projections after COVID, Texas is one of the top 10 states with the highest rates of projected food insecurity for this year, with an increase of 5.2 percentage points in food insecurity from 2018. Data, that's about a 35% increase just because of COVID. For the North Texas Food Bank's 13 counties, so our service area, they're projecting a 37% increase over the data from 2018 and a food insecurity rate of 19%, which equates to about 960,000 people. Dallas County is projected to have the fifth highest number of food insecure people in the entire country. So get that, the fifth highest in the entire country uh, versus all the other counties at just over a half million. 
you know, the long-term closing of schools and the economic instability of families has also affected childhood hunger. And while measures to increase supplemental, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for this pandemic is increasing benefits for families with children throughout the summer, it's not enough. Uh, according to the recent Feeding America projections, Texas is projected to have the highest total number of food insecure children in the country by the end of 2020. That's a staggering 2.3 million children. And the North Texas Food Bank Service Area, our 13 counties, is expected to have the fifth highest number of children who are food insecure in the, in the country as well, which is a 47% increase over 2018. So the food bank is bracing itself for high COVID impact needs projected for the next several months. We've been working with Boston Consulting Group, who's also working with other food banks and Feeding America. Feeding America is also working with McKinsey on some modeling tools. And without a second shutdown, we could see the current increase in needs going out through December 2021 at a minimum. We're continuing to monitor projections and we really won't have a clear picture of demand for a while as I'm sure many of you understand that. We also don't see the volunteer base being stable for a while. When people go back to work, we expect it's going to be back to business and not company volunteer outings. And there's still gonna be some CDC social distancing concerns. So for now, it's far safer for our own employees to have a consistent workforce on campus versus different people every day, as it would make it very difficult for us to trace exposures if someone unknowingly were infected. We hope to have the guard resources for a while longer, but we, don't, we know we won't have them forever. And as they depart, the food bank will bring on additional paid staff as we need them and also revert back to the Get Chef Done initiative. We're also very concerned that the economic recession or depression may lead to a downturn in, in donations for NTFB. Uh, you know, we're so grateful for so many of you that have already stepped up to help us, but we know that this is going to be a long-term re relief effort. And it's something that our past crisis situations, uh, you know, we haven't seen, but like say in Hurricane Harvey, we saw donations from those people that contributed to that effort fall about 50%. So as businesses and individuals struggle, we're, we're expecting some of our consistent donors may have actually less resources to allocate. Uh, even funding from the government's not guaranteed. While all the economic stimulus packages have included provisions for food banks, many are for 30-day time periods, which may or may not be renewed. And much of the food that's, that has been allocated to food banks isn't going to come on until late summer. Um, so, you know, we're sort of seeing, we're having to pick up a lot of that cost early on. So thanks for those of you that stepped up early on to help us out. You know, one of the things I do want to give a shout out for is for our elected officials. We've always said that hunger is a bipartisan issue. And really during this crisis, we have seen that in action as both sides of the aisles have really come together to support our neighbors and to help us access multiple government resources. And as the needs rise, uh, they're going to continue to be critical in this fight against hunger. You know, on the positive side, this is something that I tell people is that when you stress a, a system, you really learn what's possible. Uh, we're going to use those learnings. We're going to incorporate those best practices into our ongoing operations to really help us even beyond this COVID relief effort. We've been able to see leaders rise in the organization that might not have had the opportunity under normal circumstances. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we are committed to providing more food to our region, even in an unpredictable supply chain. We are purchasing more food at a clip of about a million dollars or more per month. Uh, while our retail donations have slipped over the past few months, we believe that they're starting to stabilize and that they'll be probably flat going forward to what we've been able to see. As mentioned, many of the government programs are really uncertain as many of them are only being approved in 30-day increments or they're one-time programs that we know are not going to be renewed. Also, some of the government procured food, as I mentioned, isn't going to arrive until late summer. The SNAP program, 
used to be known as food stamps, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, really took a hit as far as us being able to sign up people in need during that time because a lot of our counselors sit on site with our partner agencies and they had to close their operations for that uh, for now. But we expect that to make a rebound. There are some uh, ways that they're able to virtually meet with clients now. But, you know, one thing about the SNAP program is it really is the most effective way to get people who need it because it has a dual benefit to it. Number one, they're able to go to the grocery store and purchase the food that they need in an already existing supply chain. And number two, it really is an economic stimulus for those communities where, those, where they live. It helps to keep those grocery stores open to be able to have that business come in. And so as I look to wrap things up on, on the presentation, we really wanted to answer one of your most pressing questions we know, which is overwhelmingly, how can we help? We've seen that through a lot of the things that came in. You know, with us not accepting volunteers right now, we can't wait till you come back, but uh, with us not accepting them now, and because of our kidding, we're requiring some very specific items to ensure that we can provide a consistent menu in that nutritious food box. So funds are most helpful right now. Uh, we're ordering truckloads of food that comes already packaged on pallets, making it very easy for the kitting and distribution method. But we know sometimes people want to donate physical food. So we've tried to make that easier as well. We partnered with the team at WFAA and we have an Amazon wish list. Uh, and to date, we've had almost $100,000 worth of food that's been contributed just through the Amazon wish list at ntfb.org slash wish list. You know, as we believe our increased response on top of our not normal operations will be needed through at minimum end of next year, uh, please know that these donations of fund is really critical to give us that flexibility that we need to operate and try to feed as many hungry neighbors as we can. In, in all honesty, our team has been amazed and humbled at the outpouring of support from the community. We've received generous donations, and with all the unprecedented media coverage, they've really come from wide and far. Uh, you know, we've even had folks that shared their stimulus check or even just a few dollars from their unemployment with us, like Linda here, who gave us a contribution from her stimulus check, even though she's a Social Security recipient herself. The generosity that you've bestowed upon us will not be forgotten. We are your food bank. And we're gonna be here to weather this storm and all those that need us. You know, I always say that we'll do it for as long as we can because we have a great support system behind us. What you're seeing here are food bankers and the Texas Military Department National Guard assembled. We showed them a little appreciation last week, uh, Armed Forces Day and of course the Memorial Day holiday. It was really an emotional day for all of us where you could just truly reflect and see the scale of the collective efforts, you know, and I just wanted to, to, uh, to thank them uh, because they really did help us to be able to accomplish what we needed. And thank you. Thank you for allowing, for being on this call. Thank you for allowing me to share our story. It's truly humbling to be on the front lines of this relief effort along with our partner feeding network right now. You know, I'll be honest, this is hard and exhausting work. Uh, we are not perfect and we're learning more every day. We appreciate all the graces that have been shown to us by our partners and our community. Uh, when we may not have all the food that they need, whenever we go to these mobile distributions and, you know, we run out of food, we're trying to right size for those situations. But this crisis is going to make us all stronger on the other side. Know that our heart is centered on our mission and getting as much food to those who need it for as long as they need it. You know, I think back to Lulu May's mark that I showed on that first slide. And I know that everyone in our community has an opportunity to leave their own mark on history as we collectively respond to the need. So on behalf of my fellow food bankers and all those that we serve, I just want to thank you for leaving your mark. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Erica uh, to open things up for questions. And uh, thanks for submitting your questions in advance as well. Okay, thank you, Tricia. Just a reminder, if you haven't submitted a question, feel free to do so using the Q&A button on your screen. 
So Tricia, several of our participants wanted to know, how are you feeding children this summer? Right, uh, you know, great question. Um, because as I mentioned, the, the needs for children are, are greatly going up. Uh, well, one thing is we are partnering with a number of school districts for mobile pantries. They are allowing us in the summer to continue to operate there. Also, our partner agency feeding network and mobile distributions will continue to be primary drivers because we know if that child is hungry, that the family is hungry as well. So we see many children that are coming through and driving through in order to be able to get food. But we've also started adding in those food for kids bags that we would normally distribute out. Many of our school districts are also distributing those in the summer, but we're adding those into some of our mobile distributions because they have those nutritious, uh, kid-friendly foods that we know that the, the, um, the families would appreciate having specifically for the kids as well. Okay, Brad, are you on? Because this next one- I think so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, We've had a couple people also ask when we're going to be opening the production floor for volunteers. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Sure. First, let me say we, we terribly miss our volunteers. It's a, a different place here every day to not be able to go downstairs and see groups of kids coming through or families or even the corporations coming through to do uh, their part. Um, you know, as we saw COVID starting to hit and social distancing becoming a thing, uh, we, we really got concerned uh, about everybody's safety. And that's what led us down this path where we are today, where you know the volunteers started falling off and we realized we needed to keep productivity up. So uh, as Tricia mentioned, we did, we leveraged some uh, get shift done folks initially and have had the guard in place since that time. Um, the other thing that pointed us in that direction was just the need to increase the output. So it's, it's been awesome having the guard here. And as of now, they're here through late June. Um, you know, it's possible they may get some additional 30-day deployments here or see their numbers reduced. Uh, that's actually something that's sitting on Governor Abbott's desk currently um, for us and for all the food banks in, in Texas. But uh, our game plan when the, whenever the Guard does finish their deployment here is to move back to that um, get shift done team as well as to bring in some temporary staff. Again, until we know that the, the social distancing concern is gone. Um, and really that's gonna be driven by, principally by when vaccines are available and, and broader testing. So right now our, our best guess is that that's gonna be sometime in the late fall or even early 2021, but, but truly it's gonna be driven by what we see more broadly in society where the vaccine is concerned as well as social distancing norms. Okay, and thank you, Brad. I'm going to continue with some questions for you because I know participants are concerned about how we're reaching some of the rural communities. Um, and maybe people that might be homebound and don't have access to vehicles. So can you address that as well? No problem. So as Tricia mentioned, our number one distribution approach really continues to be our partner agency network. Those, those 250 independent organizations spread across the 13 counties. Um, typically through them, we move more than 80% of our food uh, that we distribute. And we're, we're really relying upon them for that last mile of the distribution. And the reason for that is because they, they're the ones that are in the community. They best know the people, uh, where they are, where they live, and how best to engage the community to help get that last mile distribution accomplished. Um, with COVID, you know, as Tricia mentioned, again, the needs have gone up so dramatically that we, we really retooled all of our operations, trying to move uh, food as frictionlessly as possible. Uh, to those partner agencies by making it, you know, free to them, removing the handling fees, like Tricia mentioned, uh, providing the ready-made kits, uh, and also providing those partner agencies uh, with some National Guard support as well. Um, so with that, w w that's been our primary play in reaching folks in rural and homebound scenarios. Um, but at the same time, we've also increased those mobile pantries. You saw some of the data on that. Um, and we've been pretty deliberate about where we send those mobile pantries, realizing that there aren't partner agencies everywhere. Uh, so how do we start to reach some of those locations where maybe uh, we don't have as much support as we have demand? Um, last thing to mention where, where um, home deliveries are concerned is we've, throughout this whole endeavor uh, of COVID, we've continued to run our CSFP program. That's our Commodities Supplemental Food Program, uh, which is basically senior boxes. Uh, we provide 
30 pound boxes of food each month uh, to seniors. And most times those are delivered all the way to, to the people uh, living in senior centers. Uh, we also push a fair number of those through our agencies as well. Thank you. Okay, Tricia, here's another one that I'm gonna have you address. What is the philanthropic need with all of the government assistance that we've been receiving? Um, great question, because I can tell you that, you know, all of the stimulus packages have included some provisions for food banks. Um, some of them are, are sort of very near term uh, as far as 30 day increments. We've gotten some additional food support from the USDA and from FEMA. And through the Texas Department of Agriculture and the Texas Department of Emergency Management. And while these sort of benefit us, there's still a lot of uncertainty about that. While they're near term, as I said, we're seeing projections that the needs are gonna go out through the end of next year. We've been told that some of those programs are not going to last that long. So we're gonna make sure, we're trying to plan for the long-term needs. We don't want anyone to go hungry. Um, the other thing that I would just say is that while these sources of food are a benefit for us, it actually does increase our cost. So we have increased fuel cost as we're delivering, as we have doubled our poundage, that means double the amount of food that has to be delivered in either mobile or to partners or how that might look like. Uh, for staffing, after this National Guard goes away um, and, you know, as get shift the Get Shift Done initiative as those workers find more work. And if we have to have more consistent workers, that means temporary employees. And so we will have to hire them. It means more equipment and logistics because you obviously can't handle the same amount of food with the same amount of equipment that you have right now and being able to, to double your capacity and your output. And the cost to move these government commodities on average across the, the network is about 18 to 19 cents per pound. On average, USDA provides reimbursement for some of that movement at about eight cents per pound. So we have to also try to fill the gap for the cost of being able to move that product as well. Thank you. Okay, Brad, this next question is coming to you. I know this is a subject we talk about frequently here at the Food Bank, but participants have asked as well, how are we working to shorten the line, especially as it continues to grow? All right, let's see if Brad's on mute. Did we lose Brad? No, yep. I nope, I'm here, okay. sorry. Must have been on mute. <laughs> yep, so, uh, so that's a classic problem for food bankers. How do you balance between feeding the line of folks that need help immediately and addressing the root causes that have put them in that line to begin with, um, of the line of food insecurity? Um, you know, one thing about COVID is, it, as Tricia mentioned earlier, it's, it's taken food insecurity and brought it uh, kind of from the back, the backdrop out to the front and center. And it's pointed out uh, as a platform just how fragile food insecurity really is um, and, and how many people are out there that are really just one paycheck away from being food insecure. We got a little bit of a preview into that, um, you know, sometime back when we had the last federal shutdown and we saw the furloughed uh, federal workers. Um, so that gave us a little window into that and we jumped into to action then. But with COVID now, it's it's much more widely based and, and widespread. Um, so we're, we're leveraging this spotlight uh, ourselves at North Texas Food Bank, as well as other food banks, uh, to really undertake a lot of advocacy efforts. Tricia was just mentioning a couple of them, but um, we're really starting to see some of the regulators and lawmakers reach out to us asking us, how does this really work? How does food banking work? How do these partner networks work? Uh, and what can we do to be practically supportive uh, not just supportive through kind of bureaucratic programs. So uh, we've been leveraging this, this crisis as a platform for educating our lawmakers in that way. And we're seeing some movement in that for sure. Um, one example of that actually came um, through a recent Dallas Morning News editorial uh, that was published around SNAP, again, that's food stamps, um, and how that's a really meaningful program and we need more of that for the reasons that Tricia pointed out earlier to keep money flowing through the economy and to the regular retailers so that it's not just food banks kind of competing with the existing distribution channels. And one thing that we've seen happen in that space was 
um, the approval of some pandemic SNAP benefits, which basically what that means is uh, any parent of a child who's on a free or reduced lunch program will now receive on their SNAP EBT card $285 um, per child to meet their family's grocery needs. Um, you know, that's just one example in the advocacy space. Our partners are also innovating in how they work with clients um, beyond the immediate food needs as well. And many of them are shifting their, on, uh, shifting their methods to online methodologies for how they interview clients, help them get connected with resources to get back on their feet um, so that they can eliminate the food insecurity for themselves. So it's a really exciting time uh, relative to a lot of these changes that are happening. Um, it's unfortunately unfortunate that we're in this situation, but we're learning a ton, and I think we're, we're creating our new normal, and it's, it's one that we won't go back uh, to old ways of doing things. So that's what I'd say. Thank you. I'm going to answer a couple of quick questions that I see coming in real time. We've had a couple people ask about our corporate food drives and if they can still host them. Um, absolutely, yes. We are extremely grateful for any product you are able to collect and donate. We will gladly accept it. We have um, a list of focused food items on our website um, just because we are using them in our, our kitted boxes right now. We also had a question about um, our fear of donor fatigue. And yes, that is a very real concern for us, especially as we um, start to forecast into our next fiscal year because we see such generous support right now and we know that the, the effects of this pandemic are going to be long standing. So we will need the, the continued support. Um, we are um, really humbled to see how many first time donors we have to the food bank right now, which gives us great hope. Um, and much gratitude for those that are supporting us. But yes, that is a concern. Thank you for the question. Um, Trisha, this one's coming to you, speaking about um, the need for that public support. What are the food bank's increased costs and how much do we anticipate needing um, to raise to meet the need? Yeah, you know, um, you know right now, because we had to flip all of our operations to that kitted box model because it is the safest way to serve our neighbors, um, that has made the cost go up. And we know that also extends to our partner agencies as well. That's why we're trying to reduce the handling fees and certainly all the things and food that we get, that's where it's going. 80% goes out to our partner agencies and to that network uh, as well. And, you know, there's so many variables and assumptions that it's really difficult right now to project what the needs might be. What we're thinking is without a second wave and if people are able to go safely back to work, which we're starting to see some offices start to open up, um, the conservative projections show that we're going to see this need elevated through at least 2021. If we see things that are starting to close down, maybe for a second time, you know, we're just trying to flatten the curve here. I'm, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of people. I went to the grocery store last night and saw people without masks and, and that I think they're thinking opening up means, hey, we're safe now. But obviously we know that that isn't what that means. Uh, if people were to continue to practice social distancing and were able to to maintain that, then we think that that's gonna be good. But we, we've been told by the people that are advising us that until there's an availability of a vaccine or a cure, which they've told us probably will not be until sometime in early 2021, that we're gonna to continue to see uh, the heightened needs of our community. And because business will not be as usual until we're able to get back to there. And because we're worrying about the ongoing recession and depression, we're also being conservative about what we're expecting to raise in our physical year. And for that, us, that starts in July. So we have had a generous outpouring of support uh, in the community these past few months, which we are extremely grateful for, because what we're doing is we're going to be using that fund to basically help us to fund some of our operations going into this next fiscal year. Because, uh, you know, just like Erica talked about, we are expecting donor fatigue. We are expecting that some of those people that would normally contribute to us may not have the funds because their businesses may be suffering or personally they may have lost their jobs or they may have their own economic hardships that they're trying to, to recover from. 
And so there's just so much uncertainty right now that uh, we know our costs are going up whenever we're purchasing uh, so much food that, uh, you know, that's the way that we're able to get the food and get it to our partners and do through our mobile distributions to get it out. I wish I had a clear answer that I could say, we're going to need X amount of funds, but it depends. I think all of that is, it, it depends. All, all, what I can tell you is that, you know, we're, we are, uh, we met with our board last week. We are projecting a negative budget as far as fundraising goes for next year, uh, as far as the increased needs of what it's going to cost us to be able to, to meet the increased needs and then what we think it's going to take to meet those needs. We're, we're projecting a negative budget, which we're going to be using the funds that have been raised to help offset. So Trisha, I think this is a, a very relevant question. We have someone wondering if you can share the story of maybe someone you've met in line at one of our, our distributions. I think about the third car in line at the last Fair Park yeah. distribution. So maybe you can quickly share what you're hearing from those that are receiving the food. You know, what we see is a lot of gratitude. Certainly we aren't, um, we're not doing face-to-face -face contact with a lot of those mobile distributions, but you see a whole lot of people with praying hands and appreciation and they'll roll their windows down and we have to wave and keep social distance. But yeah, there's actually two stories from that last distribution. I talked about the woman who got in line at 1.30 in the morning. She had been at the prior two distributions that we had had at Fair Park and she was one of those people that was turned away toward the end. She was more toward the end of the line and we ran out of food before we were able to get to her. And she's someone that actually is continued to be employed, but she has um, a family. And she's, she's one of those that even though she had some food insecurity issues now, her food insecurity has gotten worse through this crisis. So not only do we see this increased demand of new clients that are coming out, uh, but we're also seeing people that have needed food, their situations have gotten worse. And so that's why it's going to take longer for us to get out of this. She said, I just need food for my family. And so she was determined to be able to, to make sure she got some food for her family there. And then we had the, the third person in line that um, she was impacted through COVID and lost her job. And she, the same kind of thing, she had a family and some of them were still living at home. And she said, I just, I need to have food for my children and to make sure that I can continue to feed them right now, because she said, I just don't know what I'm going to be able to do, uh, you know, and how long this is going to last. And so these are the stories we're hearing over and over again, um, just throughout this. Thank you. And where can people go to find food assistance? Oh yeah, this is this is a good one. You know, ntfb.org. We actually moved up to our front page. We have a map where people can type in their zip code and they can find their nearest partner agency there. And then also there they can they can find out where the next mobile distributions are. Right now we're only scheduling our mobile distributions about a week in advance, but as we continue to move forward, we find out where the needs are. Uh, and where the greatest areas are that we need to continue to serve and how often we need to serve them, we'll be able to get to a sort of a, a longer term schedule for where we'll have those mobile distributions, but uh, both of those are found at ntfb.org. Thank you, and we've had a number of questions about how participants can get involved in their advocacy efforts and lend their voice. So you are welcome to go to ntfb.org slash advocacy and sign up for our updates if you're not already receiving them and we will respond with some additional information as well. So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up. We have been attempting to answer all questions, maybe privately that are coming in through the Q&A function. Um, everything will be documented and posted online tomorrow, I believe, so you can go back and re-listen to this recording and see the answers if you're interested. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thank you so much to each of you for your support over recent months and for being here with us this evening. As Trisha noted, much of the future is uncertain, but with a caring community, we've proven we can move mountains. So thank you so much for being part of this community and part of our food bank family. Uh, we're so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you.